Are you ready? Stand by. Hey everybody and welcome to the Three Gun Show. I'm your host, Dave Hartman, and with me today is Jeff Cramblett. Jeff, welcome to the show. Hey Dave, thanks for having me. It's like, you know, been listening for a long time and seen a lot of people I know on here, so fun to be here. Oh, that's awesome, man. I'm uh, I'm glad that you get to listen to the show and I'm I'm pumped to have you here, Jeff, because when uh when I started shooting three gun you know, your name always came up in a lot of those uh, conversations. Just before we were uh, started the show here, we were chatting about uh, some of the uh, the people that have shot like the SOF days and everything. And your name has always come up, so I'm pretty pumped to uh, actually get to speak to you in real life here. Yeah, I guess I'm what a lot of people consider one of the OGs, the old guys, just because we've been doing it so long and uh, you know been around and tried to get around to all the matches through the years. So it's like sort of been in it in all all kinds of different roles between shooter and match director and range master and so yeah i've been around the community for a while been there and done that huh yep well jeff we're gonna we're gonna get into that and uh you know i want to talk about like the old days of three gun like like you said the og three gun but uh before we do that let's let's start off with you as uh as an individual as a person who's who's jeff cramble when he's not on the range uh well Right now, I'm, quote, officially an analyst. I work for a small defense contractor named Griffin Technologies, and I, uh, we support the uh, uh, the SBX-1 C-based X-band radar, a portion of that contract. There's several contractors that support it, but it's a radar site for the, the government and stuff. And I mainly do the logistics planning and obsolescence management of a lot of the equipment, you know, on the SBX. I got you. So you're, uh, you're in Alabama, is that right? Yep, Huntsville, Alabama. I got you. So I I used to work for a a large defense contractor and I was really surprised when, uh, when I learned that Huntsville is like a hot spot for technology and defense. Like there's tons of, of, uh, engineering that goes on there for, uh, for rockets, propulsion, satellites, radar, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there's just like a, this, this giant tech area in the, in the middle of the, uh, the American South. Yeah, here we are in Redneck, Alabama, you know, as, as everybody thinks, but I think there's actually more engineers per capita in Huntsville than anywhere else in the country, and in, there's a lot of NASA work here, like you said, and a lot of defense work, and a lot of the bases that got have been bracked over the years other places, they've moved a lot of those commands down to Redstone Arsenal here, and it continues to bring in more and more technology and more defense industry, and, and I guess the capability has been seen, because now Toyota Mazda is building a production plant here. Yeah. Polaris has got a plant here. I mean, it just continues to grow. The bad part is we're going to have traffic like Atlanta if we don't start building some roads to keep up with everything else. Yeah, if they're anything like Denver, they'll rebuild all your roads to like the capacity that they needed like five years ago. That's what we do in Denver. <laughs> well, they haven't even started here, so oh, know, perfect. Gonna, you know, we're we're behind already, so it'll be it'll be great. But still, it be, wait, beats driving through Atlanta any day of the week for right now, anyway. Yeah, I'm sure most things do beat that. You know, <laughs> I, I remember like uh, I want to say it was like 2009 or 10 or something like that. There was this big move in the company that I worked for to shut down a lot of areas uh, in California, and I'm, for, I'm misplacing. Uh, I can't remember the other place, but they would shut down areas in California and then give people all the option to move to Huntsville because, uh, labor costs were much cheaper when actually putting the, um, the, the item together, whatever that item was, where, whether it was a spacecraft or a, uh, missile radar, you know, box or something like that. So a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of movement to Huntsville in, in growth in that area. It's pretty interesting. Oh, there is. And I mean, you got to look at it. I mean, Alabama's a state, I think, has fairly low taxes and, you know, a fairly low cost of living. I mean, Kimber's moving a plant down into South Alabama. I mean, there's a lot of things happening and moving toward Alabama across the country. And Huntsville's just a nice place to begin with. It's like, I mean, I grew up here and after I did some time in the Navy and then after the Navy, you know, moving around, working places, I ended up finally coming back, getting a good job back here. But we got good climate, good cost of living. Got the mountains, got 
Panama City Beach, you know, five and a half hours away. So we got rivers, you got hunting, got fishing, got everything you need right here. The only thing better is to get out like you out toward the Rockies. And yeah. They, you got to give up the beach to do that. Yeah. This place has changed too. <laughs> the Rockies are a little weird right now. I'll be honest. Yeah. I, I still like to pop out there every year or two and try to go hunting out in Montana, Wyoming, Nebraska areas and swing past Hornady on the way and yeah. you know, visit yeah. folks out there. I mean, it's always a good trip to get to come out there and see what real mountains look like. Heck yeah. Yeah. Wyoming and Montana are, are still nice. Uh, just the Denver area has gotten to be like insane with, uh, the massive, massive influx of, of people that have, have moved in over the last like three years. It's getting weird here, but Montana and Wyoming are still gorgeous. Yep. Yep. So Jeff, you know, when, uh, when we, we talked here, I, I mentioned to you that, you know, when I started shooting three gun, like 2011, like Jeff Cramblett was one of those names that, that everybody knew. And we, uh, and, and talked about like, well, Jeff does this or where I heard from so-and-so and so-and-so that Jeff Cramblett said this, you know, is kind of, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm not kidding, man. There's like all these, uh, these legends on the, on the range of, uh, of Jeff Cramblett. So I'm pumped to talk to you, excited to have you here and, uh, excited to, to share your story, but Let's uh let's take her back, man. You said you grew up in uh, Huntsville. So when did uh when did shooting become a, a part of your life? Actually, I was in the when I was in the Navy in karate martial arts, and my martial arts instructor had a bunch of shooting trophies in the dojo. Oh no, kidding! And I said, "What is up with this?" I'm like, "You're like this badass, you know? It's like throw us around like kids and and everything." And he said. Hey, martial arts isn't the answer for everything. You need to have some other skills. And he told me about the local, the local USPSA match, you know. And uh, so I went out and shot my first match there, which is a story in itself. Nobody could ever go to a match with worse gear than I showed up in my first US. Anybody that says they don't have what they need to go shoot a match, I tell them my story. They feel better, and then they're ready to go. They think they're already in, in B class by that time. <laughs> Well, I, I kind of want to know then what uh, what gear did you have with you? Well, I was a decent shooter. I mean, I've been playing with guns forever, and this was you know I was about what was I then? Probably twenty five at that time, and so I've been through a bunch of guns. Best you know, you know, pretty good shooter because I've been at it for a long time, as far as our group of friends go. But that's the way everybody is when they before they go out to their first USPSA match, they think they know how to shoot, and then they realize they don't. But yes. He told me basically, you know, gun, a holster, some, you know, extra ammo, you know, something to hold extra ammo and everything. The only pistol I had was a Smith & Wesson model 629 six-inch barrel at the time. That's the only gun I, pistol I had. I'd been, you know, cycle through, hey, you're poor when you're in the Navy, you know, as a little in, recent enlisted guy. Yeah. So I would, hey, if you want something new, something's got to go. And that's just what I had at the time. So, so I got this 44 Magnum, but he told me there was some, this power factor thing. You know, and you oh, I will beat that level, power factor, you know, to, to score major, you know, and I said, well, I don't want to score minor. I mean, I didn't have a chronograph or anything. So I'm like, OK, so I go home. But I did hand load because that's the only way a poor Navy guy could afford to shoot a 44 Magnum. And I had some 240 grain bullets and I had some of this powder. And I said, OK, well, here's the max load that ought to make major <laughs> major back, major back then was 175 back in those days. And there was no separate open anything else. It was all just one straight division. You just showed up and shot. Huh. The major was 175. So everybody typically shot, you know, 182, 185. So power factor was a lot higher than to start with. And they chronographed at your local matches back in those old days. Oh, wow. I mean, it was just something to make sure, hey, keep people honest. They chronographed even at the local matches. But so I cranked me out some loads. Nice and hot, you know, close to the max load on the chart for my 44 Magnum. I had me two HKS speed loaders, and I made me a little duct tape holder out of some toilet paper tube and duct taped around them and made me a loop to go on my belt to hold my two HKS speed loaders that you had to twist and stuck it in an Uncle Mike's holster with, and went to the range. That sounds amazing. So nobody could show up worse prepared. <laughs> Did you make power factor? The only factor? thing funnier was the performance. I started, they had, you know, didn't have just, you know, hinge plates. They were all just sit up, sit up on a dang stand. I'd hit a plate. It wouldn't land for 35 feet. That thing just <laughs> blew. Is, I mean, they were going to the next cat. Then it rolled for another 30 feet, hitting it with that 44 Magnum at 10 yards, 12 yards, 15 yards. With a, I was doing 
240 grain bullets at 1200 and something feet per second. Do the math to come up with a power factor. I can't do that math. I don't know the power factor number or uh, equation. Oh, bullet bullet weight times velocity. 1200 times 240. Oh, man. It's a lot, man. Yeah. So you definitely made well power over, factor. Well over 300 something power factor. <laughs> you doubled the power factor. I won the power factor <laughs> game that day. The, the flame coming out of that 44 Magnum would practically light close tar- paper targets on fire. The steel went for like th- 20 yards down range every time I hit it. Not that I hit it very fast, but I hit it all. And after I finished the first run, they're like sort of threw their arm around me and said, come here, let us explain a few things to you. You don't have to actually kill these targets. <laughs> <laughs> You were but like, it was on from there. The 44 got traded for a 45, you know, semi-automatic. and But nobody could show up, have a uglier performance with worse gear than I did at my first match. That is so awesome. So why did you go back? I had such a good time. You couldn't say no. Really? You know? Even after all that, you had a great time. Oh, yeah. Hey, what, if you like shooting and you show up at your first USPSA match and all you've ever had before is shoot at some cans, shoot at this, shoot at that, it's, it's like you're hooked. You've got all these courses to go through. Of course, the interesting part, too, you got to remember, this was long before the Internet or computers, for that matter. Basically, you're clocked on a stopwatch. They do your score. You get your time off stopwatch. They put it down on a sheet. You have to come up with what a hit factor is with your pocket calculator. And then you have to wait for every shooter to get done shooting every stage to see who's got the highest power factor to divide all of those as a percentage to see what points you get for the stage. Wow. wow. How long did that uh, scoring much, take? That's how much work it was back then to run a match. Yeah, you had to like want to run, to run a match. You had to want it really bad. Yeah. That was actually at the Palmetto Gun Club in, in Charleston, South Carolina. That's awesome. So are, are they still there like running still run USPSA they still matches? Hold matches and everything there, you know. It's like That's a trip. When was the last time you shot a match there? It's been a while since I shot one there, probably 10 years. I went yeah. back and shot something there, a South Carolina State match or something back there quite, you know, quite a few years ago, but it's been a while, but Gotcha. So you're in the Navy. So what what year are we talking about was uh was that first year or that first match? First match was First match was 85, 1985. Nice. So how long had uh, IPSC been around at that point? Like USPSA wasn't even a thing then, was it? Oh, yeah. That was USPSA. Oh, that was USPSA? Okay. Yep. And it had been around, shoot, at least 10 years at that point. I mean, there was already Springfield had a, you know, a big sponsored team, you know, with Rob Latham and a whole bunch of people, Frank Garcia, and everybody was all on a Springfield team. And the first match... It was probably a couple years after that. The first bigger match I went to was the Virginia State Indoor Championship. And Todd Jarrett was an A-class shooter, and Rob Latham was there. And Todd almost beat Rob at that match. But, I mean, that's back when, you know, <clears throat> Todd's an A-class shooter, you know, and it's like almost beating Rob, and Rob's showing up at local, you know, at state-level matches around the country and things like that. I mean, it was a good time. Yeah. It was a yeah. I mean, that, that is one of those things where, you, like, you look at it now and you l- realize, like, what a piece of history that was. But at the time, did it seem like something special was happening? Did you did you know, like, hey, this is oh. something to pay attention to? Oh, it was, you know, hey, Brian Enos and Rob Latham, you know, were the men back in that day. Not that, you know, Rob and them aren't now, but, I mean, they were, they had just hit the peak and they were, you know, winning world championships and everything. I mean... They were the they were the heat and them showing up at a local match, you know, or state level match with only a hundred and something people there, you know, it's pretty cool to be able to say, okay, this is the best guy in the country shooting right here in front of you. And when I'm down there as a C class shooter at the time, probably is <laughs> you know, it, it was pretty wild. But there was no fat guns. I mean, that was all single stack. They were shooting single stack comp thirty eight supers. We're shooting single stack iron sided forty fives. I mean, there there wasn't even a fat gun in existence at that point yet. Yeah. Yeah. Like double stack wasn't a thing, right? No, nope. the first big match, I, well, pair ordinance was the first one to really roll out, you know, the, the P 14s a few years later, probably in the nineties. Mm-hmm. 
early mm -hmm. 90s they came out with those they came out with aluminum frame first and people tried those but the major loads were cracking the frames around the trigger bows then they came out with a copper beryllium frame which was outrageously expensive but a few people built those and uh then they came out with the steel frames later but all through that the only caliber they were producing it in was 45 so everybody was making the conversion over to 38 super in that time frame so there was companies and people guncraft in florida and a few other people terry phelps down in florida they were <clears throat> finding ways to dimple the the mag bodies on the 45s and reform the lips or weld in spacers inside the 45 parallel 45 magazines to make them work with 38 supers you know every everything you know to get the get that game get that capacity and shoot supers instead of 45 bullets yeah man <laughs> It's, it's crazy. It, it's, it's funny. It's really funny now that people, I see people complain about a $60 STI magazine or something where it's like you were buying a $40 pair of ordnance magazine then, and then someone was charging you a hundred dollars to convert it from 45 yeah. over to 38 yeah. super. So you're having 140 or $150 in a pair of ordnance mag back in that, back in the early nineties. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's amazing. It reminds me a lot of uh, the early days of drag racing, right? Like you ever talk to anyone who uh, was a drag racer back in the day and, you know, they're going to the junkyard, pulling crap out, welding pop cans together and, and things like that to try to make speed. Whereas now you can just call up like Jags or Summit and order right out of the catalog. And, you know, it comes to you all jetted and ready to rock and stuff like that. Do you ever feel like when you order something from Brownells or Midway now, you think like, this is too easy. This should be harder. Oh, yeah, definitely. You know, for sure. I mean, I've, yeah. I've seen it all come along. And like I said, before the internet, you never even knew if somebody on the other side of the country until you went to a, ma a major match, if someone came out with a better mousetrap, a better, you know, magwell or a better, you know, compensator or, or what they'd come up with. But I think it was around 92... I mean, around the 91, 92 time frame, I shot the North American IPSC championship, which is like a level four or whatever up in Canada, you know, above our nationals type level. It mm -hmm. was the whole North American continent championship up in Canada before there was a mag bands and stuff up there. But it was 30 stages, you know, and everybody was there from the U.S. and Canada, all the best shooters, Barnhart, Latham, you know, Matt McLaren, all these, you know, all the old names. But Jerry Barnhart showed up shooting the first i guess it was a tri or, or chip mccormick whatever the, the first prototypes of what a an sti and an sv are now he showed up with the first polymer based you know 2011 gun shooting in that match i mean it that's that's when it first made its debut that's pretty cool so what was the uh what did the field feel about that that pistol did they feel like oh, oh this is cheating or? loved it Really? Oh, everybody loved it because at the current time, all the top pros had gone over to shooting like the Springfield P9s, shooting 9x21s or 9x23s or stuff, you know, so that they had capacity and, you know, be able to shoot, you know, a nine, you know, a 355 caliber bullet. But that gun, you know, going back to a full 1911 feel from a, you know, a Tang Folio type feel was, you know, groundbreaking at the time. But that's where it really came in. That was the first major match it popped up at. <clears throat> Which, so how, how, how soon after that did that prototype hit the uh, market then like what was the the lead time on it oh they started they started rolling out i mean it was just you know it started the churn right there you know and everybody trying to trying to get them and and move away from the the springfield p9s and stuff like that but it sort of reminds me of the same thing i can't remember what the year would have been <sighs> somewhere early 90s when red dot sites first came out yeah three people showed up at the nationals shooting a red dot on their pistol i think it was debbie james john dixon and one other person probably barnhart and uh it's like they're there once and everybody's looking at that like what the hell you know they're like nobody that you know because i mean it was a tasco pdp two or three i mean it was a you know it was not your little red dot it was a full size you know type red dot scope you know tube site yeah it's like the length of uh one of these water bottles right and yeah not quite that bad no but I mean, not was, that bad it was still a whole lot to throw on top of a, a 1911 at the time but hey looked at them and everything at the nationals first thing i did when i got back to florida at that time 
was go in there and I drew one up on paper. I'd taken drafting in school. I said, I can do this. I drew up a design of how to mount it and the measurements and everything. Went to my local gunsmith, slapped it down. I said, let's make that. <clears throat> and he's like, what? And we went to cut. He started with a big block of aluminum, went and cut it out. And I had one like a week and a half later mounted on my on my pair of ordnance 38 super. It's like, <laughs> it wasn't a big dot though. It was just, it was a small dot, but Tasco was modifying some of them for the big guys and, you know, putting bigger dots in them. And that's sort of where Dave Dawson kicked off his gunsmithing start. He came up with his dovetail mount, you know, and he started actually tearing apart the pro points and actually had these little micro drills opening up and making them big dots. And that put Dave on the map gunsmithing. It's like, I, I met Dave when he, just started shooting. I mean, we met down at a local indoor range in Florida and it's like, he was just starting out. He had never, you know, tweaked on a gun before. It was hilarious. Crazy. Man. <laughs> that truly is like the, uh, the early days. It's so, so awesome. So w once that, uh, you know, double stack <coughs> nine millimeter came out, like how, how soon was it before everyone was, was shooting that? Oh, you had to. I mean, like I said, it was all still one division at that time. There was no open, limited productions, anything. It was all still one division. Right. If you didn't, if you were still trying to shoot a single stack, you know, 38 super holding 10 rounds against a pair of ordnance holding like 18 or an S when the STIs hit, you know, and things like that, you know, you, you couldn't compete because where you were classed was based on, you know, almost what gun you were shooting and how well you shot. But once you'd already worked up, I mean, when I made master class shooting a single stack, or I guess maybe a pair of words at that time when I hit master, it's like there wasn't even a GM yet. You're shooting with Rob, Jerry, Doug, Caney, Brian, you know, you're competing in the same class with them and there's only one division. So here you go. <laughs> say hello to not, say hello to not winning anymore. <laughs> you know, I, I love that. I, I like how every, everyone is in the same division. It kind of reminds me of like a uh, three gun now, you know, like they're, there is, you know, open, there's TAC and there's limited TAC and limiter are way too close together. But, you know, um, I see a lot of people like, oh, well, how come I can't have a red down on my pistol or in, uh, in TAC or, you know, this gizmo or that gizmo and things like that. And it is, it is kind of funny how, um, it's, it becomes an arm race, arms race, you know, and USPSA and IPSC, they've done a lot to mitigate that arms race. But even then, man, like, you know, we're we're such competitive people that we're gonna make it an arms race whether we're changing a hammer and a hammer spring or changing you know to a, a whole new platform oh there's no doubt i mean i i started out you know shooting single stack 45 or a 44 magnum revolver went to a 45 went to a 45 yeah. comp gun actually funny part the first very first high capacity that really came out that was somewhat competitive it's like Glock came out with the 17 L's back in those early days, about the same time pair ordinance came out. And I actually loaded a 17 L to major. Oh, no kidding. Making at 180 power factor in a, in a non-compensated Glock 17 L. How was that? I knew capacity was going to capacity was going to rule. I, you know, I knew that was going to be the thing. And it's like, I said, okay, a little worse trigger pull in a Glock compared to a 1911 is worth not making as many reloads when you're looking at, you know, shooting a single stack 1911. Yeah. So, but yeah, that's, that's not a long-term engagement when you're running the 180 power factor in a Glock. <laughs> yeah. That's a uh, problem waiting to happen. Yeah. They didn't last too long. They didn't like it too much. <laughs> <laughs> I bet, I bet it beat them up. So, well, but, I mean, it, it's amazing the, the evolution of what has happened, but like you said, with the arms race, yeah, I shot open for a long time. And then I just said, I just can't keep up with the arms race. And when they came up, you know, with limited division and split the divisions, I, I said, okay, boom, I'm out. It's like, and I really haven't shot open, you know, since that, since that time. But I keep thinking about going back, but I just don't. It's so much gear you got to get. It's, I mean, I would, I do wish that going back old school, I wish TAC Optics would go back to shotgun rules like we had at Soldier of Fortune. Oh, okay. Because it's like tactical. What is tactical about a shotgun that can have as long a magazine tube on it that looks like you could joust with it <laughs> rather rather than actually, you know, something more practical or tactical? S Soldier of Fortune, you could only have a 22-inch barrel on your shotgun and your magazine tube couldn't go past one inch past the end of the barrel. 
you could still actually, you know, okay, this is a practical length. You could actually maneuver it. I mean, when I was running matches, like you know, I've run quite a few down here in Alabama and I was also, you know, the match director for the very first pro-am and things like that. I used to just take joy in saying, all right, I want the shotgun stage to start with you with your shotgun inside a small car. Mm-hmm. The people that have these 17 foot shotguns, you know, they're like running it in one window and out the other window. You know, it's like like they're pole vaulting with the thing just to try to move it from one side of the car to the other. I mean, I'm like, there's nothing tactical or practical about that thing. Let's- yeah, that's that's for sure. And I, I think it like hurts us as a sport to people that don't shoot the sport. Like it makes us look like fools when we have these uh, these giant tubes sticking out past our barrels. But, you know, a couple of years ago, I shot the uh, uh, Blue Ridge uh, match. You know, and they limit you to eight rounds. And on on, I was shooting a Stoger at the time, and I want to say it's a twenty four inch barrel, but it has a ten round tube, and so I put a two round plug in there. And I was surprised just like lopping off the extra, um, you know, six inches of the uh, the tube, how much more maneuverable it was, and just it felt much better than uh, than the uh, giant clown shoes tube out there. Yeah, it's it's a tremendous difference of you know all the way around, but and I was saying that magazine tube you know starts pushing it closer. What hey, if you want to have that in open division, fine, but yeah, let's make tactical or practical you know actually somewhat reasonable. Yeah, Jeff, I I've uh, I'm a proponent of well, so we don't we don't have a sanctioning body in three gun, right? And that's basically the reason that we have like all these these uh, weird rules because no one ever gets together at the end of the year and says, uh, okay, what went well, what didn't go well, and what do we need to change, right? So I've always said that uh, limited division and tactical are, are way too close together. And most matches, the only difference is like magnification on the optic, right. you know? Yep. So I've proposed limiting the shotgun in uh, in limited to like eight rounds or so. Uh, or 10 rounds, whatever it is, and then limiting the uh, the capacity intact to 12 rounds, 14 rounds, whatever we all decide. But then now they're different, right? And now it's there's a, an actual bigger separation between the two divisions. What's your opinion on that? What do you think? I, I could go either way. I just think they both of them need the shotgun capacity limited, you know, to make it more practical. But along with that, I think match directors have to I think some of the stages, you know, for shotgun have just gotten a little bit out of hand too. Mm-hmm. When you've got a, if you've only got an eight round tube and you run up on something that's got a forty something, a forty something round shotgun course, you're going to be all there all day loading it. Yeah. But, I mean, really, two, starting with two or three more rounds in the gun really doesn't matter. You're still having to load that much. I think some of the stages have gotten a little bit blown out too. But I understand the intricacies of running a match you want to try to get the round counts with the shotgun up a little bit you know closer to what the round counts are with the pistol and rifle it's much easier to get round count up with the pistol and rifle because you can put two on this paper and do this and do that and but i just think 40 round shotgun stages are a bit out of the box yeah plus on the uh the technology standpoint like with quad loading or loading two like it's gotten it's gotten so much easier to load a shotgun like the uh the learning curve is flattened and then you throw the extra round you know the rounds in there so now you've got instead of an 8 round tube you have a 12 round tube so you have two full tubes for um for 24 targets instead of three full tubes on an 8 round shotgun right so once yep. you start doing that and you do the math on that like okay well we got to make this shotgun course bigger otherwise it's not going to be any fun yeah you're still having to load the rounds but you know, yeah. I'm actually really, I'm actually really surprised that two gun has it pushed, you know, got a stronger response. I really forecast, you know, four or five years ago that just straight pistol carbine matches would start to pick up more and take off more and just the shotgun would fall by the wayside just because it makes everything easier. It's closer to what, you know, the police and the military use, you know, or true defensive, you know, nobody's carrying all three guns but you do actually carry a pistol and a carbine, you know, in a lot of that scenario. But I always thought the two gun matches were going to pick up and they're making a pretty big inroads with all the running guns. The running yeah. gun type matches yeah. are all just pistol carbine. Here you go. But I thought some of the bigger, the bigger level matches would start progressing toward a straight two gun format as well. It hadn't happened as fast as I expected it to though. Yeah. You know, one of my local clubs uh, held a running gun last weekend uh, I was the assistant match director for, and we on the outset 
said, uh, okay, we're a three gun club and we're going to do this run and gun. We want to incorporate some shotgun into it. And, uh, you know, once we started getting into logistics and things like that, I, I regretted it <laughs> because it's such a pain in the, <laughs> such a pain in the ass to, uh, uh, stage that shotgun and all that, that, uh, Oh God, it was pain. But so I can see how the, uh, the pistol shotgun or excuse me, pistol rifle would have been much better in that situation. I do see in like UML rules, um, you know, the, the shotgun targets are option pistol, optional pistol or PCC, yep. depending on what division you're in. And the first major that I shot with UML rules was the Wyoming governor's match. And I came home, uh, after being told it was going to be like 200 rounds of shotgun with having shot 34 rounds of shotgun <laughs> because everything else was like, well, you know, if I have to load my shotgun once, I'm going to shoot that with pistol, you know? So it ended up yep. being that way. So I do see kind of like a, uh, I guess a trend heading that way myself, but you know, I mean, let's, let's, uh, continue on our path here. So you've got a lot of experience in like soldier fortune matches and shooting three gun back before, uh, I even knew that three gun was a thing. So why, why three gun? Why, why did uh, they initially incorporate the shotgun into it in the first place? I don't know why they did, but I mean, that's the way soldier of fortune started out. And I think soldier of fortune was sort of the granddaddy of all the three gun. There were several other major three guns. The Miller Invitational three gun, I guess, was in New York. Or, and if, I mean, Soldier of Fortune sort of ruled the game. And there was people back here on the East Coast of North Carolina that I knew that actually went out and shot Soldier of Fortune quite a few times. And uh, they'd bring back the ideas from Soldier of Fortune and run them on the local level in North Carolina up, up at uh, several ranges in uh, North Carolina up around – Fort Bragg and things, you know, and turnout was always good, but they were definitely your down to earth, practical type matches. I mean, some of the soldier of fortune stuff we used to do, I mean, you were shooting, they took the door off a dang Jeep and you were driving across the desert in one of the bays out there and, you know, and it's like shooting targets with your shotgun, loading your shotgun as fast as you could out there. <clears throat> then you get to the end and ditch the shotgun and then you could run back and pick up targets with your pistol, you know, back so far, you know, before your time ran out. And what I mean, and then they took that same sort of idea back to North Carolina and they pulled us across a field in a tractor with a tractor with us in the trailer behind the tractor, you know, shooting targets out the side of there, you know, going out across the field. It's like the tractor makes it actually worse because the, the trailer <laughs> actually pivots up and down, you know, on the thing, on the hinge, instead of just, it would have been much better driving in something, but I've done both. And, you know, we did a similar thing. I mean, I took it. I ran a shotgun only match down here at my place many years ago. And uh, I took a, we took and actually made a mock up of a helicopter. I mean, with the skids and everything sitting at an angle, of a wooden rotor on it and stuff, set it in the back of a flatbed truck. And you were basically, the mock up was about four feet off the ground where you're going to sit. Put that up in the bed of a flatbed truck, which is up there about four feet anyway. So your butt's sitting about eight feet off the ground. So your head's about 11 feet off the ground started at one end of the field and there was targets all up across the field on your sides. And the truck had a, a block under the gas pedal. And we just went across there and you were shooting targets off both sides. Like you were riding in that helicopter bumping across the field. I mean, that was one of the funnest stages. Everybody wanted to do it again. It's like, it was just hilarious, but yeah, that the sounds like a great time. Of fortune just filtered back, you know, and went all across the Southeast back in the early three gun days. <clears throat> Yeah. Uh, first of all, that, that sounds like a ton of fun. I totally want to be in a helicopter on the back of a flatbed pickup truck. But so how did you hear about three gun? Like you, you'd shot, uh, IPSC, USPSA. What, when did three gun come into the picture for you? Man, I can't, I don't know how I specifically heard about the very first, the first stuff I heard about, you know, you heard about the SOF match cause there was FO, SOF magazine, right? but then there was a buddy named a guy named Jim Smith and uh, <clears throat> a couple other guys, uh, uh, Frank Glover and Ox, Os, Oscar Dean running a mat, a three gun match up in North Carolina, up around Fort Bragg there. And I heard about it through the grapevine through some guys there. I was stationed in Charleston at the time or somewhere around there or there in Florida, I can't remember the exact time frame, but I'd heard about the match and they'd come back and say how much fun they had at, you know, shooting this match. I mean, it's totally outlaw three gun, sort of a mini SOF thing. And it's, 
So I remember the first time I went, it was actually the same weekend of an Area 6 championship. And it's like, and I went to the three-gun match, and I heard people, everybody was asking, it's like, where's Jeff at the Area 6 and everything? And I'm like, he's shooting some three-gun thing. And it's like, but I went up there and actually, I think I won that three-gun match, and I was hooked after that. I'm like, oh, we just had this much fun shooting pistols. I'm like, now I'm over here slinging lead with a shotgun. But I'd actually started shooting three-gun at a local club at the same Palmetto Club years before, but they were much smaller, much simpler than this one because the ones they used to run in North Carolina that Jim used to run, he had creeks and ponds and everything on his property, and everybody said, yep, you're going to get wet, you're going to get muddy, he's going to run you across the creek to shoot targets, uh, and, and it was that way. I mean, it was as much physical and everything as what a Blue Ridge is now, but it was, it was a ball. And I was hooked from the first one. I'm like, all right, I need some new gear. <laughs> <laughs> so what did uh, what did your gear look like then at that at that time? Man, that's hard to say. I mean, I I got a picture of of one of the first three gun matches I shot at Palmetto, and I was shooting a Remington 1100 with a 21 inch barrel, with an eight round choke, you know, tube on it and a mini 14 with iron sights. Nice. I mean, by the time I shot that one in North Carolina, I know I had shifted over to an AR 15, but I'm pretty sure it was just running like a pro point PDP three red dot. And very, they shot out some further distance and stuff. I think it went to a, like a Leupold one to four because that was about the best optic you could put on it at the time. Yeah, shoot. I, I remember when I started the. Uh, I don't think there was a one to anything else, and that was like you know 2011 or something like that. But um, the one to four. I mean, I'm in Colorado, so like everybody had Burris and stuff like that. I remember the first time I saw a Leupold one to four, I was like, "Holy crap! Like that's amazing." But uh, you know, now like man, the the you know the Vortex scopes are amazing. The uh, the Burris scopes are really good. The Leupold scopes are really good, and. It's it's a good time to be into gear. <laughs> it's not like the oh, early yeah. days. It it's positively it's almost hilarious. We talk about evolution again. Back in those older days, when we were shooting those matches, Jim Jim Smith sort of quit doing those matches, and Kyle Lamb actually picked up running his <clears throat> three gun matches up in North Carolina for a few years. All of us knew what scope was needed. It needed to be a true one, and there wasn't any true ones back then. Everything was a one and a half to four or one and a half to five. I mean, there wasn't a true one anything. And and the military actually put out a requirement there. They said, okay, we, you know, they knew it. So that and they started trying to build it. And Leopold came up with that one to three CQT. Mm -hmm. But somewhere along the line, typically, you know, between what a user needs and what the military says the military wants and what a manufacturer actually builds. You know, there's usually some sort of aberration that happens in between, and, and that's sort of what happened to that. I mean, it started out as a great concept. They wanted a one to something, you know, a true one to something to get there like we still want today, but it just didn't come along for so many years, huh. you know, until you really started getting a true a true one with a good power, good variable power scope. But now, like you said, there's so many of them. You got the Swarovskis, you got Night Forces. I mean, there's so many to choose from that are just, you know, awesome pieces of glass and full of features. You know, it, it it's even hard to choose. Yeah, it really is yeah. hard to choose. The, in, unless unless it's like a Ford Chevy thing where you've got your brand and then you can just pick in that line. And even in in the uh, in the lines, there's so many different options of, you know, entry level that are either good or not good, mid range that are pretty good, and then high high end that are really good. But yeah, when you uh, <clears throat> When you sit down and you look all across, like all the manufacturers, like even freaking EOTech, for God's sake, like whoever thought that EOTech would have put out anything magnified, and they they make a great scope too. Yeah, well, I mean, <clears throat> it's kind of interesting. You talk about the companies changing. I mean, you look at Sig, EOTech, some of those things, a lot of these companies, but you have to look at what's happened in some of those companies in the last decade. Mm -hmm. You look at Sig. They have Max Michelle shooting for them. They have Robbie Johnson, who used to be on the AMU with Daniel Horner. I mean, they were the three-gun team for years. 
you know, for the AMU, Robbie works for SIG now, you know, and has been for years. It's like, you know, you look at the people that have actually left, you know, the shooting sports. I mean, Phil Strader's working for SIG now. You look at the people within the shooting sports that know what the requirements are, what the shooters need, what really works, that have actually started working within the industry. And that has really helped the quality of the product come along. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I see that. So uh, we should finish that off. Dan Horner now now works for SIG as well. But the uh, <laughs> when you see that sort of thing, you know, it, it makes me think like a lot of, a lot of times I hear um, manufacturers who don't play in the three-gun space, you know, say like, oh, yeah, three-gun's a waste of money. It's just a bunch of bullet golfers, blah, blah, blah. But when you when uh, the people that actually do pay attention to it and do spend the time to uh, not just like throw product at and to to satiate their competitive shooters, but use them for product development, use them to come up with new ideas and stuff like that, this actually is like a really good proving ground of uh, of gear. Oh, it's huge, and it, you can't discount it either because you go back and look at the old school three gun. When I was shooting those matches in North Carolina. I mean, we're sitting there shooting with Kyle Lamb, with Larry Vickers, with people, you know, from other, you know, elite teams and stuff. You're like, okay, where have they all ended up? How much influence did they have in the market? But, I mean, they were out there learning their skills because they realized right off the bat, it's like, hey, these competitors are serious out here and you've got to push to keep up and you, you can learn by being out in this environment. And, you know, obviously it served all of them really well. Yeah, <laughs> I'd say so. Yeah, it's pretty incredible when uh when you think about like the the how how short of a period of time we're talking about here, you know, 20 years from uh yeah. from that first 1 to 3 or 1 to 4 or something like that and just like absolutely so many options on the on the table for I mean just just in the optics segment not even including all the other things that we deal with in uh in 3 gun as well. I agree. I there's one more product that's yet to catch up with that, I think, and that's the uh, the small red dots for the handguns. Yeah. I mean, I still think the right one hasn't been developed yet. They're beating all around it, but for the everyday carry, put it on, combat stuff, I mean, I think the RMR, you know, the sight window's a little bit small, but it's rugged enough, and some of the others, the window's bigger, is big enough, but, you know, they're not quite robust enough. <clears throat> but I think they're with so many manufacturers working in that space now, and that market picking up and so many guns getting coming out with the ability to mount optics on them straight from the factory now. I think that new site is probably within the next couple of years, you know, that's actually going to meet and fill that niche and those requirements. But I don't think the right one's been built yet. It's the one piece of optics that's sort of lagging behind the rest. But since the manufacturers are building the pistols that way, I think that optic is, you know, it's it's got to be close on the horizon. Yeah, that's a really good point, Jeff. When you think about the, uh, you know, the practical application of one of those little mini red dots, like a lot for the longest time, they've been used as uh, like a backup sight or uh, a forty-five degree offset sight on the rifle, right? And yep. only in the last, I don't know, what would you say, like handful of years, maybe five, six years or something like that, have they become um, popular on pistols? And now they're like almost ubiquitous, right? So you can get like the Glock MOS. You can, I mean, Smith and Wesson has something that. Yeah. You can throw one on FN has the 509 and the FNS and the FNX and all that stuff. And yeah, they're, they're just freaking everywhere. And then everyone and their brother that has a, a milling, <laughs> a milling center will, uh, will cut you a little red dot hole for your, uh, uh, your, I don't know, Viper RMR or whatever it is for your, uh, Glock, you know? Yep. It's, that's the thing. It's like commercial CNC machines got smaller and cheaper in the last, <clears throat> 10, 15 years. So everybody can be a manufacturer or Smith because it's, Hey, it's pretty easy to do. And all you have to do is when you have this much precision at your fingertips on a keyboard. So that changed the world of what parts could be done. You talk about when it, when you look at Brownells, you know, you can buy whatever you want now going back before that time. <clears throat> I can't remember what the year was, but Kyle and Kyle asked me once, it's like, Hey, we need some, we need a handguard with more room than what was just on a standard M4, but we knew they all needed to be free floated because it helped, you know, from three gun and things like that. He said, you got any ideas how we can mount, you know, lights, lasers, everything, you know, on a, 
a hand guard. And I came up with a design using an Armalite fiberglass tube and then with inserts and everything on it for, you know, but using a full length on a carbine and actually, you know, started making some of those. But the problem was you couldn't buy Picatinny rail anywhere. Oh, really? Uh, I had a machine shop machining pieces of Picatinny. I went to SHOT Show. You could buy Weaver rail, but there was no source at that time when I was doing those for them that you could actually buy Picatinny rail. And I was having a machine shop actually machine all of it, you know, for the ones I was making, you know, you know, for them and everything. And I looked at actually extruding some, what it would cost to have an extruding mold made and everything to actually run it. But they wanted to run a thousand pounds was their minimum order that they would do. You know what a thousand pounds of Picatinny would look, how many feet that was? That's got to be like a, a, like one cubic shitload of Picatinny. That's got to be yes, a ton. I didn't, I didn't have enough room to store a thousand pounds of Picatinny. And then you still have to cross machine it even after you extrude it all yeah. to do it. Looking well, back, you got like 20 foot back, sticks. I should have done it because there was no source. And right after that is when Reed Knight came out with their little hand, you know, their hand guards and everything that had the Picatinny on all four sides. I mean, right after that is when Picatinny hit the boom and everything got mounted that way. And I'd have been sitting on. You know, five thousand feet of it or something. You know, <laughs> I sh- I should have done it. Just didn't know. I was like, yeah, that's just a poor yeah. poor white child. I couldn't. I could barely afford to do what I was doing. But no joke. Like, I should have pulled the trigger on that deal. I've done mill runs of things before, and like I really, if someone's listening and you could do this math for me, I don't really want to sit down and do it myself. Let me know how much Picatinny rail we could we could get for a thousand for a uh, thousand pounds. Like what? What would the length of that be? That's got to be insane in like giant twenty foot sticks. Your whole garage would be full, Jeff. Oh yeah, no doubt. I mean, it was going to be ridiculous, and <laughs> and then you still got to cross machine it yeah. all, and you know after that, and then you know drill mounting screw, you know holes in it where you need it. It was still going to take some machine after that, but I mean, it was just it was ridiculous. So <clears throat> yeah, it's funny, and now I've got like a whole bag of Picatinny in one of these drill uh, drawers back here. Just random rail sections that I get from stuff that I don't use. Yep, it's just yeah. Now the stuff's like yeah, if wherever, throw it anywhere. But one thing we found though, after doing that, we actually worked on some uh, light mounts to go on for flashlight mounts to go on Picatinny. I've got some of the old stuff compared to the Surefire and all the dang Enforce mounts and everything that's out now. <laughs> The crude stuff that was used to mount lights back in those old days was just so ugly. But we worked on a nicer one and everything. What we found right off the bat was that most people's Picatinny on most of the stuff that was being produced back then was nowhere near the actual 1913 spec. It's like you had to produce it with two-piece clamps because you couldn't make it where it just slid over and tightened down because that stuff was so far out of spec you couldn't even make it fit. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. When you talk about like the uh, machine centers and like how the cost uh, has gone down on them, it, it's just absolutely incredible. Like the quality of stuff that you can get for the, uh, the low price too. You know, there's, there's still junk out there, but um, man, if you stick with one of the, uh, you know, the, I guess uh, manufacturers that, you know, it's, it's really hard to buy uh, crap now if you stick with the, uh, the mainstream. That, that's fact. It's, you know, like I said, with the tolerances, which you can get out of all the machine centers now, it's like people can produce really great stuff, you know, and there's no reason for things to be bad unless they're just still running it on some old machine in China. But yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, well, Jeff, let's, uh, let's get back on, uh, uh, the old days of three gun here. So when, uh, w- we were talking before we started here that you had to read about, three gun in in a like a magazine or something you're like oh this match is coming up or something how many matches do you think there were in the country like just a ballpark when uh when you started shooting three gun when i started shooting three gun as far as three gun matches yeah i knew about five okay i mean five big you had soldier of fortune you had the mill a miller three gun and you had, I think you had, you know, Rocky Mountain is very old. Superstition and Rocky Mountain were both pretty old, but I can't remember, you know, what years they actually kicked off. And then we usually had some stuff in North Carolina <clears throat> that, you know, but that was the major ones and that was all there. That was it. And how so, many of those matches did you go to? 
Well, I never made it to Miller, but I mean, I've been to Superstition, been to the Rocky Mountain, went to two SOFs, you know, and I shot quite a few of the ones in North Carolina and stuff. The travel back then just would have, you know, killed me. It's like back when I was in the Navy, I didn't couldn't afford that stuff to go clear to, you know, out west too often. Plus, you only had some 30 days leave a year, you know, and you didn't necessarily get to choose when you got to take it, depending whether you were gone at sea. But <clears throat> so it was pretty tough. But the North Carolina match was always fun. And it's Soldier of Fortune taught me a lot. Yeah, it, it was really quite funny, too. And I mean, it still happens today. One of my first impressions when I went to Soldier of Fortune, I don't even think I met him there. But one of my first impressions is the first time I saw Benny Cooley. OK, I mean, ben, Benny has been winning. You know, he's like the world, you know, Soldier of Fortune, world three gun champion. You know, and you, you've got guys out at Soldier of Fortune kitted out with everything you can possibly imagine. Mag pouch, chest pouches, this, that, everything else. Benny comes walking up and stuff, you know, and he's got a holster, a couple of magazines, you know, and, you know, and an AR, you know, and that's pretty much it. I mean, simplicity, you know, in just poetic. It's like, you don't need all that stuff. You need just what you need to get the job done and you need flawless execution. And that's one of the things I've learned from watching Benny. You know, I got, we got to be good friends over the years, but you know, Benny may not move as fast as everybody else or anything, but, the way I describe Benny is he has flawless execution. He gets up there. It's very smooth, very deliberate, hits things, you know, doesn't waste time. You know, he's got a plan and he executes it really flawlessly. And the consistency that he does it with, you know, across the board, you know, ends up doing really well on the scoreboards. Yeah. And even now, that's the uh, key to winning. <laughs> Just execution. Yeah, I mean – it's like you can run around and go try to go as fast as you possibly want, you know, and you watch the wheels come off and you end up out in the field or you can have a plan and you just go up there and just nice and smooth and steady win in the race. It's, you know, if you do it across a whole bunch of stages, the more stages there are like that, typically the better you come out. Mm -hmm. So when, when you started shooting uh, SOF then, was it, like a uh like a game because i i consider three gun just like flat out game that's that's how i figure it in my head like i don't feel like i'm training for the end of the world or anything like that um some people do use three gun as like uh getting better using their defense carbine their defense pistol or whatever so um when when you shot what was it was it you were shooting a game and oh yeah it, or, it was just it was just a game. I don't consider it training or anything else at that point. I mean, I was just shooting, having fun, you know, testing my skills against the best people in the country, you know, doing it. Cause I mean, they were all there and seeing how you end up and trying to get better. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just a competitive nature. It's like just being out there trying to do it and have fun. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess like the name soldier of fortune, cause I associate it with the magazine. Right. Um, always makes me think that it's more like paramilitary or whatever. Were there people out there that were taking it a little too seriously or? At the point that where I started going, I don't really think there was, there, there's probably a few of them there, but I'd heard stories from some of the earlier years when, yeah, there were some very serious characters, you know, that were attending that match and the parties and things in Vegas and the, the shenanigans were, you know, way more than, you know, what we do is three gunners these days. It's like, you know, but it tamed down into a competition, I think, in the, you know, in the years by the time I got to it. Gotcha. And, and what kind of time frame were we talking about? 96, 97, I think. Okay. Something like, something like that. I can't remember for sure. I got, I got the patches at home still. I have to, I'd have to go back <laughs> and look at them. So this is like right around the, uh, the Clinton assault weapon ban, right? Uh, my SOF would have been before that. It may have been, I can't remember. Like I said, I'd have to check on the years, but okay. I can't well, so then <clears throat> you shot before the, uh, the assault weapons ban. So what, what was like, what was that time like after the, uh, the ban? did like three gun go away, go underground or, um, did people just get more clever? Like what was the, uh, the culture? No, I like? mean, nobody changed anything. I mean, if you already had magazines, you were good to go. So as long as you already had, your 30 round magazines and things, you know, they couldn't, you know, all the new ones being produced, you know, had to say, Hey, for military or law enforcement, whatever use, but 
the pre, you know, if you already had your pre-existing ones, you were good to go. So it didn't really matter. Mm-hmm. Nothing really, nothing changed at all. Did it slow anyone down from starting or anything like that? I think it would have, you know, it may have slowed some people down starting just because, hey, if you bought a Glock in that time frame, all it came with was a 10 round magazine. But I still think there was enough of the old ones floating around in circulation that, I mean, I don't think it greatly impacted the three gun world. It may have impacted USBSA and some of the, you know, the shooting sports there a little bit more, but three gunners are still three gunners. They're going to, you know, <laughs> they adapted and overcame. Yeah. We kind of deal with that a little bit in Colorado too, because you know we've we've got uh, our BS uh, magazine limits here too. It's fifteen rounds, and uh, a lot of, a lot of times I uh, I'll get questions from uh, three gunners in uh, in Colorado, and they're like, "Well, what do I do about like the magazine laws and this and that?" And I'm always like, "Well, do you want?" I, I, you know, I just kind of like point them off to someone else. Like someone else can tell them. Like I for like uh, I guess someone who represents companies i'm on the show it's like i can't tell you like just drive to wyoming bro and get a get a magazine but that's what everyone else is doing yeah 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 i mean it's it's kind of silly with the millions of magazines that are already out there to try to have things like that but i mean it didn't none of those things actually affects three gun that much in my opinion i mean people they're still shooting three gun in california for you know so that never stopped yeah, yeah. There's three gun in California. I've heard there's a uh, uh, three gun in in New York as well, which is insane to uh, to my brain. Uh, Canada, you know, shoots three gun. They just yeah. do. Di- they have different restrictions. There's there's three gun in Mexico. I thought I shot the USPSA three gun nationals in New York one year. Yeah, I couldn't believe they held it there. Seems like I also a poor choice. That me and the two guys I was riding with rode right through New York City with all of our three gun stuff in our car. <laughs> we were just hoping we didn't get in an accident because it was going to be hard to explain if we got rear ended and that trunk came open. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that seems like a poor choice of location on their part. Yeah, it's like let's see, drive to New York. It's like how many states do you have to go through to get there from Alabama? Yeah, no kidding. Jeez. Well, so then, uh, so you've seen a lot of, a lot of changes and, and transitions in, uh, in three gun over the year, like, uh, over the years, like how, how are three gun matches, uh, different now than, uh, than when you first went to, uh, those first matches? I don't know. A lot of the other ones, I think were a little simpler back then. I mean, and more realistic oriented i mean there weren't so many bay stages it, i mean there was all kinds of stuff that just out through the woods and things in the old days but the participation wasn't as large and as participation goes up you, the logistics dictate that you've got to make stuff simpler to get the people through and i mean the only thing that i you know that's sort of going the wrong direction you know you know is some of the stuff it's like a lot of stuff now you know people are running you know for profit type things where everybody in the past, you know, it was all, Hey, it's for the love of the sport. Let's all get together and do this. And, you know, there's a lot of money getting involved in it now. So, you know, that I think is actually <clears throat> impacting, you know, potentially the quality of what goes into it now, you know, just because, okay, you only put so much time in there when you're doing it that way, when you did it solely for the love of everything, you know, I think the, uh, the stages were a lot more fun, but I don't know. They're all still fun. There's there, the thing is, there's plenty of matches out there to go to, so people can pick and choose which ones they want to go to, and you know that's what I do. It's like, yeah, some of them you go to, some of them you don't. But yeah, I mean, there's people. It's hard to know with so many matches going on now. It's hard to even keep up with, you know, who's who's running the match, you know, and how, you know, what are they doing? Yeah, I, would, I always want to know who's running the match. You know, and uh, I'm very fortunate through what I do that I know so many people, right? And I can say like, oh, okay, well, I I like Jim Bob's match. I'll I'll go there, but um, I find it difficult to gamble on like a first year match, you know, because I I and and I this is coming from a guy who just ran a match for the first time last year or last weekend, so I understand <laughs> first of all, but it's it's tough to uh, you know commit a thousand dollars worth of, uh, travel expenses plus, plus ammo plus match fee to, uh, 
to gamble that the uh, the match is going to be good. So it's you got to deal with those reputations. And back in the old days, you know, you had five matches to uh, to choose from. It was probably much yeah. simpler. It's like, do you want to go to all the matches or to some of the matches? But right. Uh, so how do, how do you choose the matches you go to now? Like, what's your what's your criteria, if you, if you will? I like you. It's like I want to know who's running the match because I mean that makes more difference than most anything. Because it you know it all comes down to their mindset. You know how what are they doing and how do they run a match? I mean, some people understand logistics and matches run very very smoothly because. I mean, I was a match director for the the first pro am. Everybody said you can't run a match and have five hundred people in it and have the you know this many pros, this many ams, and fifteen stages. I'm like, yeah, you can. You just need enough experience and planning to do it. But so I mean, anything can be done, but the person has to have some logistics. And some people I know, it's like, and I view the shooter, and I think all the match directors should view a shooter as the customer. You're providing them a service. They're spending a lot of money and a lot of time and travel, like you said, and they, you know, they're coming to have fun and and do something. It's like so. I mean, I like matches where it's like I don't have to get up at the crack of dawn and get out there. And I want matches that finish up before dark. You know, I'm not shooting in the dark where I've got this can't see the targets as well as the guy that shot at noon because you didn't plan the stages well. You know, and it's like everybody doesn't get the same opportunity. Plus, you don't get the same opportunity to go socialize with all your friends and things. So, I mean, I look at who's running a match and based on what I know about their experience running matches to say, okay, is this going to run smooth? And is it going to be something I really enjoy going to? Because I still want to go to enjoy it. The whole reason I'm going, if I'm spending that money and stuff, is to go see see the friends and do it. You know, it's like it's it's just a social event, you know, that I get to shoot guns at. But, I mean, if I think they've run them a good match, but I have, hey, I've rolled the dice and taken chances on first-time matches before, and some of them have turned out fantastic. And other ones, you're like, yep, uh, roll those dice and you know, <laughs> lost the lady luck. But, I mean, it goes both ways. But primarily, it's just a matter of looking at who's doing it and how well I think they're, you know, going to – they do on planning matches so that it's going to run smoothly and have, be a lot of fun and, you know, get done on time – comes down to the logistics really yeah Yeah. logistics are a huge part of uh match management and when when i see like uh you know i guess match runners that have been doing it for a long time and brag about how long they've been doing it and then their schedule sucks i just like shake my head it's like jesus apparently you didn't learn anything yeah you either learn from mistakes and you know correct them just because you've been doing a long time doesn't mean you've been doing a good job (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that is a good point. That is a good point. Yeah, in in, uh, yeah, we, in aerospace, we always had the uh, you know the older guys like, oh well, that's just the way we've always done it. It's like that doesn't mean that's still the right way to do it. Like we've got computers now, we don't draw on <laughs> drafting boards. Yep, exactly. It's like you know, and some people take after action reports and criticism and you know suggestions well and actually do something with it, and some people continue to make you know, do the same thing. So, you know, just, but yeah. And it's tough to take criticism, especially when, uh, like you said, uh, a lot of people are in it for the love, you know, and they look at it as like the, all their hard work and their emotion that they put into it. And, uh, like, you know, it's like their baby, right? So they're oh, almost, it reluct- is. yeah, they're reluctant to take, uh, any sort of, uh, criticism, whether it's actually warranted or not. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. If they're running a match, I mean, you've done one now. I've done a bunch of them. It's like it takes a tremendous amount of work. You know, you've dedicated hours and hours and days and weeks and time and effort and money usually and time you could have been doing something else to create this for everybody to go to. But hopefully, you know, you do it and you want them to have a good time at it. And you're never going to make everybody happy. So you're always going to have some people that, you know, are going to complain. But You know, you really don't want a whole bunch of criticism. It's like constructive suggestions and things. Great. But I mean, but hopefully you do a good enough job that there's something to build from and it's something that doesn't need to be, you know, it's like, okay, that just needs to be scrapped. (laughs) Yeah. No kidding. Well, Jeff, how did you get roped into running that first uh, pro-am with 500 people? That's, that's a big undertaking. That's a, yeah, that was kind of crazy. Actually, I got asked by the nobles up at Rock Castle. They said, hey, 
AR15.com approached us and they want to run a match. They'd like to sponsor a match, but they want it to bring in new shooters, not just the same two or 300, you know, people that go to shoot all the matches all the time. You know, how do we bring in more sh shooters to do a match? And I said, well, let me think about that. So I went home and sort of hatched the plan and came up with the idea of saying, okay, you do a pro-am scenario and you have the am stages look very similar to the pro stages and you co-locate them where the am stage is right next to the pro stage so that it sort of looks like they're shooting the same thing but make the challenges less round count, less distance, less technical, but they also get to see, see the pros sitting there shoot it and see their heroes sitting there shooting it right next to them, a similar stage. So we did eight pro stages, seven am, but I drew the whole thing up and said, okay, this is how you do it. This is how many people you can put through it, you know, based on this many, you know, this many stages and this much of this. And I said, that's how you, that's how you, that's how you do it to bring in shooters. They said, well, how do we keep people from being pros and ams? And I said, you do the am prize. There's no way you can tell somebody this is the line where you're a pro or an am. You're going to have people cheat that line all day long. I said, you make the, am random draw you make the pro order finish because no pro is going to go down there and take a chance on a random draw <laughs> prize that he thinks he can shoot good yeah and, and no and am is going to go up to the uh the pro level if they don't think they can uh, uh yeah, if they're an amateur they want to hey yeah i was going for this random draw prize table and shoot this and i made you know the came up with it did all the money everything you know figured it out make the am stuff half as cheap you know it's like in the pros and to encourage them to shoot, you know, and stuff and said, do the am prize table the night before and the pros shoot a couple extra stages the next day. So that you can't run both prize table, a 500 person prize at one time, laid it all out. I said, there went back up, said, here's what you do. They said, okay, who, you know, that looks good. That looks like it'll work. And they're like, who could do that? You know, who do we get to run it? And I said, well, I'd say this person, this person, or this person. And none of those people would do it. So then they came back and asked me. Nice. You were your own fourth choice. <laughs> oh, I didn't want to. I didn't want to run that. I'm like, <laughs> it's like, I know I've run matches. I knew what that was going to be like. Hurting all those cats and doing that much. But no one else wanted to do it. And I said, you know, that's a great idea. Let's bring in some new shooters. Let's do this. And we, uh, we got a ton of help. To run, you know, to sponsor the match, National Shooting Sports Foundation, AR15.com, Joe DeBurglis on the NRA Board of Directors, Lisa Supernoff from the NRA. It's like there are just tons of people jumped in, you know, helping to work with sponsors. I mean, we ended up with a, and I took, you know, unlike what you get most of your stuff now, we took part of the entry fee money because when you had that many people, we started getting prizes in and started trying to keep track, and I wasn't sure we had enough. So we actually spent some of the money that we took in, you know, and the entry fees, you know, to buy more prizes. So, you know, some of these manufacturers that donated things, I went back and bought additional product from them. You know, they gave us a good break, but I mean, we actually spent some money with them too, you know, to help out too. And uh, got, I handpicked, I mean, one of the things that really makes match run is your ROs. They got to have the right attitude and experience. <clears throat> Luckily, I knew enough people. I begged, borrowed and stealed enough of them, handpicked all the ROs to run the match. You know, had plenty of other people volunteering, but I had a, I had enough, you know, to run the match. And so I knew there wasn't going to be a lot of reshoots and it was going to be nice and safe. I asked Benny Cooley, you know, it's like, I said, hey, some of these AMs are going to, it'd be cool if they could get some training. You want to come set up and do, you know, a training class like the day before or something during, you know, the match. And he said, well, how about if I just do it free? And he sort of helped me hatch the idea. And we had the free pro clinics there where we had Jerry and Bruce Pyatt and Benny and, you know, just, you know, just a handful. I can't even remember who all it was, but we had, you know, like six pro clinics, you know, going on in the afternoons after the AMs and shoot. But I mean, it just went freaking fantastic. And it's like, it was just a lot of people I knew all jumped in to help, you know, to make it happen. And uh, it turned out great. But we had like 15 stages running at the same time, four or five vendor shooting areas all running. LaRue brought their dang barbecue truck, you know, trailer and we're, you know, with the barbecue out there. But it, the great part is like the sponsorship kicked in was huge. B biggest prize table of any match that's ever been. Hmm. And 
But I mean, Steve Hornady was there. The Brownells were there. I mean, you had, you know, the heads of a lot of these companies at that match, actually, you know, seeing all the new shooters and everybody there and all the interfacing. It was really fantastic. I sort of, I sort of glad they actually drug me into it, you know, all said and done, but <laughs> I put about six months of my life into pulling that off. And I can't tell you how many trips from Alabama to Kentucky building props and everything else for it, but I'm like, it was crazy. Yeah. That's a ton of work. You know, when I, when I hear, hear stories like that of like, uh, you know, that first pro am and how big it was, um, I kind of wonder like where the enthusiasm from the industry has gone. Like, you know, Pete Brownell doesn't really go to matches anymore. Steve probably only goes to the Hornady zombie in the heart heartlands kind of thing. Is it just because we have so many matches now? Like it's not even, you know, uh, an event, you know, it's like sun comes up every day and no one really cares. Well, yeah, there is a huge saturation of matches and, and it's not just, you look at the manufacturers. I mean, it's not just, you've got pistol matches, USPSA, IDPA, whatever, you know, you've got a plethora of three gun matches. And then you've got, you know, some carbine and rifle matches. You've got the PRS series matches going on all over the country. It's like, how would they even know which one, you know, if they could only pick, had only so much free time, how would you tell them which one to go to, to go see, you know, hang out with the people? Yeah. I mean, I mean, the, the loop, the saturation of matches right now is so great that I could, I, if one of them called me and said, Hey, which matches do we need to go to? If I want to go to three matches, you know, just go, you know, see a bunch of people and hang out and do this and stuff. So I wouldn't know what to tell them. Yeah. And it's tough. And I get asked that all the time by, um, by different people in the industry. And I, I do have a list, but you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's hard when, when you're sitting there, it's like, well, these are the three I'd recommend. And if, if you, uh, like those three, then check out these other six, you know, like it gets so big, you know, because there, there are a bunch of great matches. It's almost easier to tell people which ones not to go to. Yeah. Yeah. That's a fact. Yeah. But I mean, think of like from a consumer perspective, what an amazing time we live in when, you know, one to six scopes are everywhere and, uh, and you have good matches all over the country that you can go to within right, I mean, six to eight hours of your home. Yeah. It used to be, you'd wait around and say, okay, you know, the next good match coming up is two months from now, or this, or the next match I can go to is, you know, this month. And, and now it's like, okay, there's a match almost every weekend. I look and someone's saying, oh, I'm going to this match this weekend. I'm like, crap, I didn't even know that was happening this weekend. Yeah. Just, Cause you can lose sight of them really, really fast. Yeah, and then I went and shot the uh, Red October Kalashnikov Championship in uh, in Utah, which was happening the same weekend as Surefire, uh, like an yeah. hour and ten minutes away in Vegas, and it was also the same weekend as Fallen Brethren, but Fallen Brethren got canceled. It's like that's three big matches that draw a sh- a lot of people in in the same weekend. It's like right, goodness, and that probably does. And if then if you look also. If you looked at the PRS series, they're probably having like the Bushnell ball or the yeah. brawl or the gap grind or a match at core or some. You know, there's probably some big PRS match or two going on at the same time or the NRA World Shooting Championship. That was you know? happening. <laughs> that was ha- wait, or no, that was last weekend. But yeah, there yeah. was some sort but they're of back to back so close together. Yeah. You know, you're like, yeah, it's crazy. And then, uh, you know, in Colorado here, like I said, we had that running gun last weekend and everyone's like, oh, it's first, uh, first season, like first season. What? Like I'm a three gunner that doesn't compute. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, there's, uh, there's so many competing opportunities for your, uh, your entertainment dollars, you know? Yep. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. Well, uh, Jeff, so we've got, a uh, we've got people listening along and, uh, and watching along with us and, uh, we've got a few questions, uh, in the chat here that I want to throw by us. So first one is from uh, Carl Volt. And Carl Volt says, uh, I love hearing about this old stuff. And uh, this is in regards to the uh, the conversation of your first days in IP, uh, USPSA. And he says, is this back when the 9 by 25 Dylan was still a thing? Oh, my first days were long before the 9 by 25 Dylan rolled around. Oh, really? But that, that thing is hilarious. I mean... You know, the nine by twenty five was like a, a ten millimeter cartridge neck down to nine millimeter, and it was mainly the <clears throat> Springfield Armory sponsored team, uh, 
Robbie and Kippy and a bunch of those people started shooting it. And they knew they gave up magazine capacity, but they were shooting like 115s. But I mean, the amount of gas behind that thing was just tremendous. It, that thing was like a small howitzer going off every time they pulled the trigger. But I specifically remember there was one stage, and I'm thinking it was one of the Area 3 championships in Missouri or somewhere out in that area. I'm pretty sure it was Missouri. But you had to shoot off a plywood bed that they had at some targets, you know, up above your head, you know, downrange, you know, with and your head was on that end. And it's like, RO pushed the timer, and I can't remember which one of the dang Springfield teams it was. It just like lit off that nine by twenty-five. He sort of rolled on his side, so the comp was pointing, you know, off to the side, off the side of the bed to shoot the targets up above him. And it's like I swear it blew the RO's hat off, and that RO could not get away from the concussion of that nine by twenty-five fast enough. I mean, those things would practically kick up dirt around wherever you were shooting. There was so much concussion coming off those guns. No shit. And so what is the uh, idea then just to make major power factor with nine millimeter? Well, yeah, nobody had actually started shooting nine millimeter. You're shooting supers or at that time you're shooting supers or, you know, to make, you know, make major and, you know, open guns. But they said, oh, this may give up a little power factor, but they were running, you know, lighter bullets fast enough to, <clears throat> I don't know. It really just, you're like, what are you doing? You're using a 40 caliber case to make that. It's like, why? But it didn't last long, but it was a, it, it made a heck of a bang while it was there. Yeah. Literally and figuratively. I kind of want to shoot one now. All right. Uh, Jeff, the uh, next one is from Mig Sticks, who is uh, John Migliano. And he says, uh, ask Jeff about his experience at the IPSC rifle shoot in Russia. Plus, he needs to give me a call. <laughs> yeah i was lucky enough it's like you know the ipsc world rifle championship the first ever was held in russia last year and you know i sort of looked at it when I mean, a lot of people looked at it you know and they said eh, okay that's pretty cool but you know hauling guns all the way to russia this that and everything you know it's like so i sort of let it go by the side but then later on as it got down to it they decided to add in another a uh an open senior team and i got a call and said hey you want to be on the open senior team with mike voigt and jojo and barry duke and stuff and i'm like okay fine so i cr started i cr started cranking down at the last minute and practicing like you know six eight weeks eight weeks before the before the show before the match and everything and cranked down got all the paperwork done got it in run all through there and stuff it's like luckily one of the people that was actually going with the team uh <clears throat> leah wiggins actually lives here in huntsville her and stefan you know they're both shooters but she had actually gone to like grad school or whatever in russia after so she spoke russian so she was going along you know to help interpret stuff so she was here she helped get all the paperwork through so kicked off over there and that was a pretty tremendous trip it i never thought i'd be carrying an ar-15 and a bunch of 500 rounds of ammo into russia before but you know and getting back out anyway yeah, yeah. but we went over and you know, our team took the gold, which was a truly tremendous and humbling experience. And, you know, JoJo took first in our division and I took third in the division. So we both got medals, you know, medals and trophies out of that. But when you do it, they do the big IPSC world shoots, just like the Olympics. You go up there and stand on the podiums, you know, and they play your national anthem and stuff. So here you are in Russia up on this big podium, like 700 something people out there in front of, you know, listen to the our national anthem play, you know, during the award ceremony. Wow. And you're like, all right, this is friggin' awesome. You know? <laughs> it's like, I mean, basically it's almost the size of the Olympics when it was over there, but it was a really cool experience. Yeah. I don't know how you top that, man. That's a pretty amazing experience. I don't know. I've, I've been sort of blessed, sort of lucky that way. It's like me, Kurt Miller and uh trapper and Daniel Ernest, and a few people all went to the, IPSC's first world shotgun championship back in 2012 and uh Kurt took first in our division and I took second in that so I've won medals in both the IPSC's first rifle championship and first shotgun championship but you know I'm like it's been a fun ride riding around the world with you know shooting with some of my friends heck yeah just amazing that the uh you know all the experiences that it would offer you just you know plinking targets and bringing steel you know yeah i'll start it out with that 44 smith and wesson and look what i'd ended up yeah 
Ah, uh, all right. So Carl Volt has another question. He says, uh, "Has Jeff looked into in range TV's style of two gun in Arizona matches like Finnish brutality and desert brutality?" So that I think uh, is piggybacking on the conversation we had about the resurgence of uh, two gun matches. I really had no. I hadn't looked at them. I mean, that's a little far out for you know travel from here. But yeah, I mean, like I said, I think I think two guns going to pick up and continue. Especially, I think. At, Running guns gonna pick up and run some of that, and I think some of the bigger two gun matches are gonna gonna pick up. I think it's easier for new shooters too, because then they don't have to have three guns, you know, to jump in. But you may have to change the name of your show at some point, you know. Dude, I've thought about that a lot. Uh, I really have. <laughs> like shit. Well, I pretty much nailed the uh, three gun market with the three gun show, but you know, I like to talk about PRS. I like to talk about pistol stuff, you know. And we have we've had a. Uh, USPSA GMs and IDPA masters on the uh, uh, show as well. So uh, it's pretty much just practical shooting in general. Yeah, but there you go. But well, I tell, you know, one of the funnest matches I've ever gone and shot was like the uh, the NRA World Shooting Championship where you yeah. shoot twelve different disciplines. But you know, and Trigicon did their version of it as well the second year. You know, where they had the, the same similar thing, and it's like that's really what those matches. I'd always shot clays pretty well and shotgun pretty well, but those matches right there that I went to actually are what started me shooting a little bit more sporting clays, you know, in the last year or so. Okay. And, uh, because yeah, after the Trigicon match, I figured out that if I had uh, hit three more clay pigeons out of the 75 possible, cause we shot three clay sports that I probably would have made about 6,000 more dollars. Oh, wow. Those are about, oh, wow. yeah. Cause I'd have gone to the money table instead of the prize table and I said, hmm, maybe I need to be able to hit these a little better. Yeah, those are $2,000 pigeons. But, I mean, it's really, you look at three-gun, I think three-gun shooters are the most versatile shooters in the world. I mean, if you can shoot pistol, rifle, shotgun, in the environment that we do, running around everywhere from, you know, base stages to 500 yards, you know, out at Rocky Mountain and things like that, you know, if you really are a good three-gunner and you understand, you know, the ballistics and everything of your gun and how your gun's set up and how they work, most versatile shooters in the world. And you can see it at like matches like the NRA world shooting championship and stuff, because it's three gunners that fill the top ranks. Yep. I've never looked down to say it's like, okay, who's the first non three gunner in there. But you know, three gunners do really well when you cross over out of things. But I also believe that crossing over and shooting some of the sports outside really helps your three gun game too. It's like when I, went out and started shooting some sniper matches and before PRS was even a thing, you know, some long range matches and sniper matches. I mean, when you start sitting there shooting targets out of the thousand yards and, you know, 1100 yards and then all the way in, you know, <clears throat> and then you come back to three gun and say, Oh, 350 yards chip shot. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, it, it's not, you know, it really helps you because you learn how to build a, a good position to shoot from really fast. You know what your trajectories are. You know what certain wind's going to do. Because when you deal with it, those longer distances, you know, the effects up close are way less. So, I mean, it really helps your game. And also the same thing has happened when I went, I actually went and took some uh, sporting clays classes. I mean, I do some teaching and things like that. So I understand the, the value of good instruction. So if I was going to go learn how to shoot sporting clays mm -hmm. better, I, I went and found a world champion level instructor, Wendell Cherry up here in uh, Tennessee, lives in Tennessee and teaches right across the line in Kentucky. And I really never realized that Clay's games were as mental as they actually are. Really? There's really so much more mental aspect to it, but so much of that mental aspect also relates over. You can't be all high tension, you know, and jerky like we are in three gun shooting Clay's. You have to be, slower smoother and everything but a lot of it comes down to your mental state it's like if you've got a true pair flying you've got to hit this one and get over there well you need to move fast but you need to maintain a calm so that you can see it and a lot of that applies back over to three gun shooting we shoot and change positions really fast and everything but that doesn't mean you go crazy like a jack russell terrier that means you shoot and move fast but your demeanor and everything your mental state really needs to stay under control and calm so that you're pushing the trigger and seeing the dang targets and seeing the sights like you need to. But it's amazing how a lot of these other cross training to other sports, you'll do well when you go shoot them, but you'll also learn things that'll make your three gun game so much better. 
Yeah, man. Yeah, that, man. Very well said. The uh, the NRA World Shoot is on my short list for next year for sure. The uh, Just the amount of shooting that you get to do in all the different disciplines I think really appeals to it. And I really liked what you said there about it you know, helping your, uh, your three-gun game when you go back to that as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, you look at it. You sit there and have to practice some bullseye shooting with that, you know, a pistol one-handed. It's like and you throw back your, you know, both hands up there, you know, in three-gun, and you're like, oh, yeah, bap, 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 no biggie. And you look at people that really excel at things like that. Bruce Pyatt, you know, always shoots really well at Bianchi and everything. It's like, you know, he's at the top of any three-gun match he's going to, you know, and has been, you know, for just decades. It's like just a solid, straight-up, good, consistent, you know, calm, demeanored shooter. Mm -hmm. I mean, a fantastic Mm -hmm. guy to boot. Good. All right. Well, Jeff, you know, I've, I've, uh, taken up uh, a lot of your evening here, but I got a couple last, uh, questions that I want to ask you that I answer all my guests. And then, uh, maybe we can do a round two sometime. Cause I feel like, <laughs> I feel like, man, I could just sit with you for hours and, uh, have you tell me stories about the old days. This, this has been a ton of fun, man. So first, you know, we've talked about the, uh, um, uh, popularity of three of two gun matches uh, rising, and uh, you know other disciplines as well. But where do you see the sport of three gun headed? Hard to say. I, I hope it rotates back around toward the roots a little bit. Like I said, you know, get the tactical shotguns back down a little bit, shorter magazine capacity and things. But I mean, that's all by individual match directors. Like I said, there's no governing body, and I don't want there to be. There was a big push quite a few years ago about doing that, you know, with bringing Rocky Mountain, Superstition, Pro-Am, you know, all these matches under one governing body, you know, for a set of rules stuff, and it's like, I don't want it. <clears throat> Each of those matches, you know, Blue Ridge, Rocky Mountain, they all have their own distinct flavor. They all have their own distinct style. Yeah, there's different rules that you got to go pay attention to to be able to go shoot the match. But each of them is so individual, and I don't want them to all be cookie cutter the same. It's like, I like what they are. And and the people that were running them, you know, like doing things their way as well, you know, and, and they've been successful. You look at, you know, sometimes you take and organize something, you know, you've seen Three Gun Nation go up and then start to come back down. USPSA membership, you know, they've done this, but their Three Gun really hasn't taken off, you know, terribly. But all of those legacy outlaw three gun matches is all full to capacity with waiting lists every time one of them happens. Mm-hmm. So letting things be individual and be their own thing is not bad. I don't want to see them all come under one thing. It's like they can have different rules. Like I said, I'd like to see some stuff roll back closer to the more practical aspects instead of a complete equipment race. And some of the stages may be, you know, go a little more practically oriented, but like I said, I go to have fun. So if they set it up, it's going to be fun and we'll go do it. And I don't want them all to be the same and I don't want it all to be bays. I don't want, you know, so, but we'll see. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and then the market figures it out, right? And then you, uh, exactly. you go shoot the matches you want to shoot. You don't shoot the matches you want to shoot and everything, everything works out. <laughs> yep. Pretty much. Yep. Well, Jeff, uh, last question here, give the audience, uh, or let me rephrase that in the form of a question. What is one thought or one piece of advice that the audience can take away with them, uh, from our, from our chat here tonight? One piece of, I don't know, advice on the shooting or just, you know, it's like, Hey, just, no, the one piece of advice, you know, comes down to that. It's like be in it to go have fun, you know, pick the matches you're going to go have fun at that your friends are going to go at. I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. If you're going out there, you know, just trying to win things or trying, you know, getting too hard on yourself about it, you know, and taking the fun out of it, you know, you're never, you're not going to stay with it. I mean, I started the practical shooting thing in 85. So you do the math, how long that is. I can't, I'm, you know, 33 years, public education isn't working. (laughs) I mean, I've drifted in and out of the different shooting aspects along the way, you know, but I still shoot them all. I shot, uspsa indoor match last wednesday night and you know i'm going to shoot the sporting clays nationals this weekend so oh cool <clears throat> i'm not quitting i'm not quitting any of it but it's just you know you just roll in and out as you get a little bit tired through the years but 
just have fun with it and, and don't be afraid to go experiment with other things because it, it quite possibly will help your game over here. I mean, it's really funny when you go back and look at it. I remember Rick Birdsall's first match. That oh, yeah? The first major three gun that him and Chip Montgomery and those guys all went to. And it's like, he'll tell the story if you ask him, you know, it's like, he they're staying at the same hotel and everything. It was in Missouri. We're shooting and and it's like, and he walks out and we show, we show up and they said, come on out, you know, and we walk out and me, Kurt Miller and Trapper and a bunch of people are sitting out by the pool, drinking beers with a pizza and Rick's looking around and there's a sign that says no food or drink or anything. We're all sitting in the hot tub, you know, at the hotel doing this. And it's like, this is their very first match. And we're, you know, asking questions and telling stories and everything. And, and it's like, and now look at him, you know, it's like, you know, those guys, it's it's been fun through the years watching people come in and watching some of them really excel and, and you know and just have a great time with the sport you know and become you know the people they are. Yeah, that's a great point, and you know I've seen that a you know the the three gun show has been around for like what three years now or something like that, and I've seen that even in that short amount of time like you know someone will contact me and say hey man or you know I'm really digging your show I'm just getting into three gun, and then uh, shit like a year later you know they're top 20 in a match and it's just incredible to see the <laughs> the uh amount of success one can have with effort you know so it, it's pretty cool oh, to uh to be a part of yeah, that it's a, yeah and like you said the difference between now and the legacy there was no internet in the early days yeah there was nobody teaching classes there was no youtube to see how other people were loading shotguns or any instructions or how to modify your guns or you know anything it's like it is so much easier now to be successful but I mean, the people really take advantage of it and it's amazing how fast they can climb, you know, and how quickly they can climb compared to what it used to be. Yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. And, uh, so yeah, if you're listening, uh, stick with it, you could be running alongside Jeff Cramblett. Yeah. Yeah. Running past me. Running you know, past like... him. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. I'll still be smiling. Yeah. Well, Jeff, man, I, I really appreciate your time, and uh, thanks for coming on the show, man. I, I wanted to have you on for a long time, so I'm glad we uh, we finally connected and were able to do this, and I really enjoyed our chat here tonight. And uh, I'm not kidding, man. Love to have you back on uh, and do a part two sometime. Hey, glad I could come on. You know, Maybe we'll get into something specific next time and just, instead of just rambling through the years, but uh, enjoyed it and everything, and uh, we'll look forward to next time. Right on. Well, thank you, Jeff. All right. You're welcome. See you quick reminder that if you enjoyed this episode of the podcast subscribe in itunes google play podcast addict or wherever you get your podcast content so you will always get the very latest thank you so much for downloading listening and subscribing to the show i'm dave hartman and i'll see you on the range if you are finished unload show clear